So I'm going to uh, take you through a couple cases uh, to introduce this topic. And, and I, I've already kind of given you a background of the innervation and uh, the anatomy. I'm going to take a, a patient right out of our clinic. I, I see this all the time. 32-year-old woman comes to the ophthalmologist for eye pain, saying, what's wrong? Something's wrong in my eye. She has a history of migraine that used to be episodic, meaning less than 15 days a month, and is now <coughs> chronic, meaning more than 15 days a month. And, uh, and her eye exam is normal, except you notice that she has a reduced tear lake, and you smartly do a Schirmer's test, and you find out it's only four millimeters. And could these be related? And if so, how? Now, you, this cartoon that comes out of Flugfelter's uh, uh, AJO article several years ago, I think it's just uh, a reiteration of everything that I just was talking about, that of course the eye is innervated by the trigeminal system, and of course it has reciprocal innervation with the autonomic system, and that when the trigeminal system is stimulated, the autonomic system kicks in and is supposed to make more tears, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously, this little uh, trigeminal nucleus is not sitting in a vacuum. It's connected to that trigeminal nucleus caudalis and, and all of the um, uh, central brainstem components that I, I talked about earlier. So um, I'm going to tell you about how <coughs> tear film dysfunction may contribute to migraine. And I'm also going to suggest that some of the symptoms of dry eye really may be a migraine or peripheral nerve symptom. And those of you who see a lot of dry eye and you test them and they, it, uh, they test like they've got fine aqueous tear film production are going to be surprised uh, that, you know, maybe migraine uh, may be playing a role in this. Well, the first uh, clue to dry eyes and migraine having some connection is in Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, and it's been known for quite some time um, that, uh, you know, almost 20 years, that Sjogren, people, individuals with Sjogren's have a higher incidence of migraine. 46% of patients with Sjogren's have migraine. And, you know, when you think of only 20% of the population, women and 10% of men, that, that's uh, a lot. And that's been uh, uh, corroborated by a more recent study as well. And this is one of the very first study, only six years ago, okay, this study came out of Turkey uh, where um, they took a group of migraine patients and they didn't specify chronic or episodic whatsoever, so we don't know at all, uh, versus controls. And they did Schirmer's tests, they did uh, uh, tear film breakup time, they did that lysamine green staining, the conjunctiva, they did the ocular surface disease uh, inventory test, and lo and behold, they found that people with migraine uh, tested, uh, had lower Schirmers, uh, had uh, worse tear film breakup time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this was one of the first clues. And I saw this about six years ago. Um, and, uh, and of course, I've been interested in the eye and migraine all along, but this I thought was interesting. More recently, there's been a plethora. There's, it's, there's going to be a lot of studies coming out, and I hope somebody from Cornea is in the audience, but we really need to grab hold and understand this better because this is a study done in a neurologist's office. Uh, Dr. Wong in Canada, these Canadians that are very ingenious, uh, went and uh, sat, they did osmolarity testing on, on tears in a neurology practice. And they found, first of all, um, you know, they did 34 patients. Most of these were women, of course, because uh, migraine runs in women. 76% uh, of these people in this clinic were disabled by their migraine. Uh, almost half had daily headaches. Um, over a third had dry eye symptoms, okay? Then they did osmolarity testing, and they defined abnormal as greater than 308 or greater than 8 milliosmoles per liter uh, between eyes. And by that testing, they found almost half had abnormal osmolarity testing versus about 20% in the general population. And what they also found was that patients with migraine with aura had a higher level of positive osmolarity testing than those with aura who didn't have um, uh, uh, dry eye and uh, dry eye symptoms, and those with daily headache also had uh, osmolarity. 
But what was really interesting was that the headache and, um, did, and the OSDI did not correlate with osmolarity. So in other words, um, you couldn't say how, if the headache was really, really terrible, the osmolarity would be terrible, or the OSDI would be terrible. It didn't correlate with that. Yes, Judith. Did, did, uh, did they test um, just the 35% who had the dry eye symptoms, or did they test everybody? They tested, so in this study, the question was, did they test just the people with dry eye symptoms? They took 34 patients, and, um, and these were people who were, you were excluded from this study if you had a known dry eye, or you were told you had dry eye, or anything like that. You're just in a neurology headache practice. So uh, they didn't uh, sort of stratify that way. Kathleen? Yeah. So the ocular surface disease inventory is interesting because Eight, eight of the 12 questions are totally non-specific to dry eye. I mean, the, I mean, I, 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 so painful, sore, blurred, poor vision, difficulty reading, difficulty driving at night, difficulty with computer work, difficulty watching TV. And there's only really four that are more really dry eye specific. So gritty, you know, painful eyes in windy situations, dry areas, or air conditioning. And so I guess it doesn't surprise me in a sense that it didn't correlate, that the severity of the headache didn't correlate with, I should say, it does surprise me a little bit it didn't correlate because I, I think most people with migraine, just because of the eight non-specific questions, would have a high OSDI score. Good point. That's a good point. But uh, I can just tell you that, that it's not just the OSDI score, it's the DEQ5, right. and uh, all of these scores are uh, definitely elevated. Um, here's another study that came out looking at wavefront analysis on the cornea. Uh, and uh, in this study done by Shetty in Boston, uh, uh, these were all individuals with no aqueous tear film deficiency. And, um, and then he studied, uh, and this didn't show up as well as it did on my computer, uh, he studied patients with migraine, which is 60, controls, which was 80, and he found that uh, aberrations in the patients with migraine, and these were chronic migraine patients, were higher than those with control. So there's something going on here uh, that, that uh, I think is interesting. So these dry eye symptoms are not, not rare. You see these symptoms in your practice every single day. Uh, and 20 to 30% of patients, and maybe even higher in Utah, over 45 can have symptoms, but they don't always have low aqueous tear film production. And uh, there have been some very interesting studies that have come, one study came out of the VA population, and this Vierhoff study came out of a group of a study on women in dry eye symptoms. And they looked at concordance, meaning that they looked dry and they were dry, and then uh, people who, who said they were dry but they didn't look dry at all or didn't test dry, and what was interesting was that these people who had this discordance had higher incidence of arthritis. They also had increased incidence of, in, of anxiety, depression, PTSD, and allodynia. Uh, so, so sort of a sensory disruption. <coughs> Do you think they asked about migraine? I couldn't believe it. I, I wanted to write a letter to the editor and say, how could you take this paper without asking about migraine? And, I mean, more common than most of those other conditions. Now, uh, many of you may have known about the study that was done by Krista Kennard when she was a fellow uh, with us. Uh, she looked at chronic migraine and did look at uh, corneal nerve fiber density and symptoms of dry eye. And she took 19 uh, patients with chronic migraine, most of them women, and controls and um, she applied a dry eye questionnaire, and I think in this case it was a DEQ5. And then she did basal tear film secretion, corneal sensitivity, tear film breakup time, and they were all normal in all of our patients. But when she looked at the corneal nerves on the cornea, she found that the nerve fiber density was reduced and the nerve fiber length was reduced. Uh, the nerve branching pattern didn't seem to be uh, that different. And so we published this, um, let's see, when was that? Uh, in 2015. And, um, and then this paper came out uh, last year. 
by Shetty again in Boston. And what they did was they looked at the same structural changes in the cornea in migraine, patients with migraine, chronic migraine, and photophobia, and chronic migraine without photophobia and sex match controls. They measured all those subbasal nerve plexus changes in chronic migraine and looked for structural changes with and without pho photophobia and controls. And what they found was that uh, the people with migraine and photophobia in general um, were the ones that seemed to have the biggest changes in their corneal nerve density. So the branching was different, their fiber length was dis different, their area was different, and so forth. So, um, so this is an area that really I think has, I mean, this, those are the studies that are basically out there um, on, on those corneal nerve anatomy and uh, looking at migraine. So I wonder if there isn't evidence for some central sensitization that could be coming with this dry eye symptom problem, and especially when dry eye symptoms don't respond to a topical anesthetic, where there may be a heightened sensitivity to pain. And sure enough, this article by Crane came out and showed that in these individuals who have these symptoms, not only do they have the dry eye symptoms, that they don't look dry, but they have the dry eye symptoms, but they have by cutaneous allodynia testing, if you touch their skin, and there's various ways of doing this test, they, are high, they have a heightened sensitivity to uh, skin testing as well. This would suggest that this is something more central, right? I mean, this has gone beyond the trigeminal system. It's now into the thalamus or into the, to the brain itself. There's a central process uh, going on. And this has also been corroborated by another investigator. Um, this uh, Perry Rosenthal uh, in Boston also uh, has lots of papers on dry eye light pain. He's called it DELP, uh, and neuropathic light pain, and he's called it NOPE. Um, and, uh, but these are varying degrees of dry eye testing and looking at evaporated hyperalgesia, and um, he's shown associations with a lot of eye procedures. So the more eye procedures we do on these people, like cataract surgery, LASIK, and if, and if they've got any sensitivity like this, uh, you get into trouble. And, and he also noted that, the, that it's highly associated with fibromyalgia, Sjogren's, and even blepharospasm. And he also feels like this is pro there's probably a peripheral sensitization that takes place, and then that is followed um, uh, tri with a trigeminal me mediation into a central sensitization uh, to a brain problem. Uh, and I thought this article was really interesting that came out saying, well, okay, so how, what am I going to do in my office about these people who've got this <coughs> neuropathic eye pain complaint? And so they recommended first determining whether it's peripheral, you know, by putting a drop of anesthetic in. And if it is, goes away with that, then really work on ocular surface treatment. Uh, and if it's not sent, uh, peripheral in, in that it's, it seems to be more centralized pain. <laughs> they say send them to a neurologist, but you, you don't have to do that. You can, you can try a few things yourself. Uh, they recommended low doses of tricyclics or something like gabapentin, and then many of these are mixed, meaning there's both a peripheral and a central component, and then they recommend lifestyle and complementary therapy. I, I, would, I would say that in all our migraine patients and patients that have chronic pain, we should be uh, working on lifestyle, sleep, uh, and, and so on. So I, I think the dry eye and corneal findings are really interesting. I don't think we've got the whole story yet. We don't really understand. Is it the migraine process that's participating in changing the cornea? Or, is, or mediators, remember the trigeminal nerve releases CGRP um, and, uh, into the cornea and there's substance P and all kinds of uh, metalloproteases that are present in, in the cornea, but also that's the same stuff that comes out into the dura, by the way. Um, could we somehow study that? Um, is continuous uh, stimulation by, because somebody has dry eye symptoms and dry eye, or actual dry eyes, is that producing more chronic migraine? Uh, and is, is uh, the dry eye symptom participating in central sensitization? And are, 
dry eye symptoms when you don't have findings, really a form of allodynia, like what we see in migraine. And we don't, we don't have any idea whether treatment with uh, local artificial tears or cyclosporin or punctal occlusion or leucosamide or flaxseed oil or whatever is going to have any effect on this process. But I think it's really important for every ophthalmologist to be aware of this connection because you're going to see this every single day in your office. Okay, any question of, or uh, thing about the dry eye before I move into just um, uh, eye pain? Yeah. I just have a comment about, um, I mean, thank you for trying to address this incredibly common but even more complex and challenging question, but um, I think that we see every single day people in this mixed or combined category where there's central and maybe, maybe even cognitive kind of upregulation of what's going on. And, you know, in my practice, I found that there's a huge, huge, huge um, spectrum of corneal findings. We try to find, we try to see things that we can observe on the cornea, tear foam breakup time, staining, etc. And dry eye is so complex itself in that, you know, almost every dry eye patient has blepharitis or a little allergy or whatever. And that's one of the reasons things like tear osmolarity, just not a very reliable index. Um, staining is pretty, pretty reliable. You can observe it, you can use it. The anesthesiometry, things like that. I think the real nerve fiber layer stuff is really interesting. So it's just, it's almost an impossible thing to sort out in a full Well, I would, I would just submit that uh, it may be impossible, but it, it, it's studyable. Okay. Well, I just want to make an point about um, drugs like gabapentin, which work pretty well for some of these really challenging cases, but they almost always increase the neuropathic state of the cornea. In other words, the findings increase, but the symptoms decrease. And so certainly there, is, there can be a disconnect between what you see on the eye and, and the pain that the people have. So, so that's, that makes it even harder sometimes to treat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I want to challenge the cornea service to uh, partner with us and, and um, try to work on this problem because I do think this, we can observe the corneal nerves. We can't go in and look at the dura, okay? But we. Captain, has anybody looked at scleral contact lenses in these? No. Uh, not that I'm, no, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I have a lot of literature, but I'm not aware of that. Okay. Put scleral lenses on. All right. Well, let's. I'll talk to Dick's Petty. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'd love to partner on it because I, I do think that this is something that's overlooked by the migraine community, but it's certainly overlooked by ophthalmology as well. I mean, yes, Randy. So, I, I mean, I think Mark's pretty well covered the key issues, but I, I think, sadly, dry eye syndrome is a, is a garbage basket term for at least several different conditions that, that uh, you know, we, people have dry eye type symptoms and we look at them uh, and, and, and there are those who, who certainly, this, this is more of a, of a dysregulation as you're talking about, the, the allodynia. Yeah, some of those, it's clearly, they're just, you know, pure dry eye and uh, that's part of the reason why all of these things, again, as Mark said, it can be extremely difficult. But, Whenever you have people with severe dry eye and you uh, give them topical anesthesia and it hasn't helped their symptoms any, you know that's immediately something. Mm, there's something going on here that's way. And and then you'll have those in whom you will work hard, the cornea's looking better, and their symptoms are absolutely no better. So, but you, and, and I get others in which, as as Mark has also talked about, that uh, um, frankly have pretty bad symptoms and we're perfectly fine. With them. You look at them and I say, no, I'm not. But you see, I, I maintain that we should be looking at the kind of person that gets these symptoms because if you're predisposed to migraine, you're predisposed to sensory dysregulation in your brain. Okay, sounds are louder, touch is stronger. Uh, it, it's, you're dysregulated by your sensory system. It's a sensory system processing disorder. And so I think that we should be thinking about 
disorders that have sensory processing and migraine is so common. It's, it's a simple thing to even ask about in your clinic. Um, and, and these people with this dissociation, as I showed before, you know, they have pain problems. They have fibromyalgia. They have um, arthritis. They have, you know, all kinds of other things going on that are part of this sensory processing uh, disorder. So I just want to bring to your attention that this is a common problem. If your patient has migraine, you should pay attention because that may help you understand better the way their brain is working, the way they're processing uh, pain better. And it, we don't know if some of these newer migraine treatments that we've got now, like the CGRP antibodies, are going to be helpful in people who've got these dry eye pain problems because maybe this will be helpful to them. I don't know. It, just like gabapentin, we use a lot of gabapentin in headache and chronic pain, and I know in corneal pains. Uh, but, it, it, but it's something that we should be at least aware of as in ophthalmology. Can I just make one more comment about the sensory processing thing, but also I think emotional processing, like the anxiety part component of this. We, we know that there are people who just power through their somatic symptoms no matter where they are. There's something about if it's in your head or your eye or your brain, it's uh, way worse. And absolutely. So, so I want to just mention about what Mark just said about emotional processing. So. Guess what happens when, and, and I'm not going to talk about photophobia today, but I think it's very analogous, okay? Uh, guess what happens when you have chronic discomfort? Well, you, and this has happened in laboratory animals. So they took laboratory animals uh, that, uh, mice that are blind at birth, and then they just shine light on them, and these little mice squeak and, and you know, make noises like they're being taken away from their mother, okay? So it's a stressful event. Well, then when this, these mice are examined under the microscope, guess where all the, you know, chemical light-ups are in the brain? It's in the amygdala and in the, um, uh, in the limbic system. So what it means is that pain gets into our limbic systems and participates in creating anxiety and participating in helping to make people depressed. So it's, it's, I know that, that some people are resilient and some people aren't as much, but this is a brain processing problem too. And, and also hereditary, there's a hereditary component who's more at risk to get into depression and anxiety as well. So I think, I think it's very complicated, no question about it, but I think that the cool thing is that we can start understanding this on a neuroanatomic basis, and then that means we can study it, it means we can have hypotheses, it means that we can uh, think about ways that we might actually uh, start to understand and treat it. Yeah, Randy. So this, this actually fits somewhat with uh, some of the things that I've done with dysphotopsia. Right. Um, and uh, uh, my explanation to patients is, is that the, the brain is a very powerful analog computer with a variable gain. And that you don't necessarily control the analog computer component, but you can control your gain. And uh, what I've noticed are those who are overwhelmed by this just absolutely focus you know, on, on the symptoms. And, and those in whom it resolves uh, don't. And I've actually had success with some patients who will follow, which I've said every day I want you to say, this is going to get better, I'm not going to worry about this. And you truly, yeah. and they're trying, and I get, I'll get a call and say, it just disappeared. And it hasn't disappeared. It just, just, they finally have kids their brain. This is like most of us. These symptoms are there. There's all kinds of things that we're, we're seeing and, 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 and experiencing in our vision and the rest. And I think it's the same thing where you'll have people who have incredible floaters, and you'll say, my gosh, you do these floaters well. You'll say, what floaters? Yeah, they, and then you'll have others in which in which you can already find a floater, and it's right. driving them crazy. And so I, I, we need to remember that that, right. that that there's a huge variation we can do. I, I remember I had a medical student, and I I showed him uh, through his endoptic phenomena how he could see his vessels, and he couldn't quit seeing his vessels. <laughs> I know that's pretty cool. Um, so I think because Randy brought this very interesting thing up, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Uh, that uh, when I was in Switzerland, I found this very energetic <coughs> medical student, um, and then I found an energetic medical student here who actually went on to ophthalmology at the University of Wisconsin, Chris Bowen, and we looked at all these patients for eye pain to come up with what diagnosis was in our clinics, and I'm um, just going to cut to the chase so that in ophthalmology is no big surprise. Most of it was conjunctivitis, dry eye, 
uh, and blepharitis types of things. And in neurology, it was really migraine that caused the eye pain. And I'm just going to go, uh, so, you know, the traditional red eye into ophthalmology and the white eye and the migraine. But I want to uh, caution you to, uh, that many of your eye pain patients are going to have migraine uh, because it's a very common problem. Um, but I want to talk, uh, because Randy brought this up, I'm going to just skip to um, this, this, um, this one. And that, this is... You know, if I said that the visual quality of life in, in migraine and chronic migraine is reduced, and we talked about, you know, the pain problems and all this kind of stuff, why else could it be reduced? Well, migraine has a lot of visual symptoms, and we're all familiar with visual aura, and I'm going to talk a little bit about aura and how to distinguish it from persistent aura, but all these people with migraine often have... Uh, because it's a sensory processing disorder, have stripe-induced discomfort. M many of them also have photophobia. They all have photophobia when they have a migraine, but in between, many of them have photophobia. And then there's this entity called visual snow. And this was a patient that got sent to me for treatment of prolonged aura. So um, it was a 17-year-old guy who has a family history of migraine. He had his first headache at age six. He had his first migraine in eighth grade. Um, and then a few months later, he developed migraine with aura, and it was a blank spot in the center of his vision with flashing lights that progressed out into the periphery for 20 minutes. Then he got a six, uh, very severe headache lasting nine hours, and now he has a migraine with aura about once a year, uh, and, and he tried, treated with uh, sumatriptan, which caused chest tightness, so he quit that. And, um, and the question was, uh, you know, he had this migraine prolonged aura. So I said, well, what are your symptoms? He says, well, I see silvery lines that are always present if I concentrate on them. I see floaty, squiggly lines when I look at the sky or snow. And as long as I can remember, my, vi my vision looks a little pixelated or grainy. And, um, and the symptoms were not associated with a headache. He sees through the visual phenomenon and, uh, and his past medical history was negative. He's on vitamins, and he's a good student. He, and, it, and of course he said, and it doesn't interfere with my driving at all. <laughs> uh, I want you to know that, so, because his mom was going, should he be driving? And uh, so he had good acuity, his fields were normal, his disc was normal, he, has, he had a normal neuro exam, and he'd had an MRI scan, it was normal. His depression scale was, minor, minor, he had no anxiety uh, with GAT7. And so, you know, the differential diagnosis was, is this migraine with aura? Is this persistent aura without infarction? Is this migraine aura status or is this visual snow? So I wanted to go through these different types of visual symptoms because I think this is confusing to a lot of ophthalmologists. One, typical aura. And a uh, typical aura is a neurologic process. It's dynamic, meaning it changes. The visual symptom starts gradually and it develops and gets bigger and bigger over a period of time, usually less than an hour. It may or may not be followed by a headache. And, um, and it usually is the result of cortical spreading depression in the visual cortex. Now, there is these are definitions that are in, if you ever have trouble sleeping, just get the International Classification of Headache Disorders. It's about this thick. It's like the DSM-6. You know, it just gives you every single kind of headache disorder you could think of. Anyway, prolonged aura is an aura that lasts more than 60 minutes, but less than four hours, okay? And, and that's a, a prolonged aura. A persistent aura without infarction is a typical aura, meaning it starts out, and, but it lasts for longer than a week, and you've done neuroimaging and there's no stroke. And then there's a thing called migraine aura status, but this is a typical aura in a patient with migraine, with aura, that has at least two aura episodes a day for at least three days in a row. It's kind of like having status epilepticus, you know? It, it's happening frequently. That's migraine aura status. So these are the kinds of, of auras. So blurred vision isn't an aura, okay? And a spot in the vision, uh, it, it may not be an aura. It depends on the tempo of it and, and what happens during it. Now, 
Visual snow, uh, the proposed criteria, I um, worked with Chris Schenken and Peter Goadsby on this uh, paper. Uh, uh, visual snow is dynamic, continuous, tiny dots in the visual field for three months. But you have to have a couple other symptoms. And we, this study was done kind of by a crowdsourcing <laughs> almost technique of getting all the people with visual snow to, uh, and then studying them in San Francisco. Um, uh, palinopsia, or, which is either a persistent image when you look at something and look away, you still see it, or trailing images when you see something move and you see a trailer go behind it. Enhanced emtoptic phenomena, meaning that you see excessive floaters, uh, self-light of the eye, that's that light that you can see when you close your eyes and are in a mellow mood sometimes and just watching your eyes, and photopsias, photophobia, and nyctalopia or impaired night vision. And the symptoms are not consistent with typical migraine aura, and they're not explained by another disorder. So I showed him these pictures, and he said, oh, well, I got grainy vision just like that. I see floaters in the sky just like that. And this one you can see are little itty bitty teeny weeny dots that are just sitting there. Uh, he didn't have palinopsia, the kind that you look at an object and you still see it, or the kind of trailers uh, at all, or just this little um, light in the dark. So he met criteria for visual snow. He had the grainy vision since childhood. He had enhanced emtoptic phenomenon and photophobia since childhood. And his symptoms were not typical. He does have migraine with aura, but the, this is not a typical aura. And so it was not a persistent aura that, that we needed to treat. This disorder is seen in women and men. Uh, usually there's a history of migraine. Over 60% of the people have migraine, but almost 90% have some headache disorder. And, and that needs to be sorted out because I do think that this is a brain processing problem. Uh, anxiety and depression, uh, about 20%. Um, many people, a quarter of the people that have this say, I've had this since childhood. And in most, it's continuous from the beginning and there's a high level of tinnitus. Uh, visual snow has sometimes been called the noise in the visual system, and uh, tinnitus is sort of noise in the auditory uh, system. It can be associated with hearing loss, et cetera. But these people have lots of other phenomenon, and, and so in your office, if you hear about some of these, you might want to think about it. So uh, the palinopsia, pa uh, floaters, the blue field etoptic phenomenon, Photopsias, photophobia, nyctalopia, trouble concentrating. Over half the people say this distracts them. And, uh, and surprisingly, in this uh, uh, series, 37% were disabled, uh, which is really startling, right? Because this is a phenomenon that you know uh, shouldn't be disabling, you wouldn't think. Uh, there is, of course, and this is a brain problem, um, so there's been shown to be hypermetabolism in the right lingual gyrus and the supplementary visual cortex, as well as in the cerebellum. Uh, I keep asking all our visual snow people, why do you think the cerebellum? But I'm not quite sure about that one. And they've also seen um, a thalamic cortical dysrhythmia, so kind of brainwave uh, abnormalities uh, and, a funny, and a, a dysfunctional neuronal excitability uh, as well has been seen. And, uh, and, and, and this, I think, is important. It probably is an impaired habituation response uh, is the best way to explain it. And then there have been studies that have shown um, hyperexcitability in the primary visual cortex. So this is where they, the thought is that this is what's going on. And this visual snow is something that um, uh, you, you've got to make the correct diagnosis. You can't just, you know, you have to think about this. In our clinic in neuro-ophthalmology, we see people who have these really weird visual symptoms all the time. And the things I, the one thing that I do worry about a lot is retinopathy. Because it can look just like a retinopathy early on. You may not see anything in the retina, but it could, it, and we have seen a few of these people who've got some visual uh, visual snow turn out to have anti-retinal antibodies. So I don't, or anti-glycine antibodies that are present in the retina. So we, we, we do need to keep thinking about this problem, uh, but many of, most of these are not uh, something like that. It's, most of them are visual snow. 
Um, you can treat the underlying migraine. We gave this guy Elmo tryptan, which is a different tryptan, and he didn't have any side effects from it. Uh, medications don't work for this. Um, the best medicine has been lamotrigine, but lamotrigine is also used for anxiety and depression, and uh, and it's an anticonvulsant. It may be helpful. It's the only one that we, there's had some success with it. Nortriptyline, carbamazepine, sertraline, which is Zoloft, has been used. We've had some luck using the FL41 tint or blue-yellow spectrum filters. Uh, for some of the people, it seems to dampen uh, their sensitivity a little bit so that they can ignore it a little bit better. So I hope I've convinced you that um, migraine is intimately and integrally uh, related to the eye and, uh, and to vision, and that we really have to be looking at this dry eye um, story, because I think that there may be some uh, important things that we could do to improve migraine, but also maybe um, help our headache colleagues understand about pathophysiology of what's happening peripherally. Um, eye pain is in your clinic. Most of the time you're going to see it. If you don't see it, be thinking about migraine and be thinking about cluster and be thinking about optic neuritis uh, and uh, um, if, if, if you don't see a red eye. And then I think this visual snow is more common than pre previously really re recognized because a lot of people have it. At Nanos, uh, we ask people to raise their hand if they have visual snow. And I mean about a quarter to a third of the population raise their hand. So neuro-ophthalmologists uh, have, uh, have a little visual snow. And I think this also means that we have to address that visual quality of life because uh, visual quality of life is just as bad as people with Graves' disease, IIH and optic neuritis, and which just uh, tells us that this is something worthy of our attention and um, our, uh, our study. Uh, in the novel library, um, if you need a handout for your patients, uh, you can go to the patient portal and get a handout on migraine, and it's in about uh, 15 to 20 languages uh, so that you can hand out a, a thing about migraine. And I want to thank, I didn't do uh, any of the work that I talked about here was ne never done solely by me, believe me. Uh, but I want to thank all the student, the army of students that uh, we've had the pleasure to work with over the years. Our fellows have been amazing. And I can't ask for better colleagues than I've had at the University of Utah, University of Zurich, and, um, and, I, and Rami Burstein in Boston listened to me about photophobia and then went to the lab and figured out a whole bunch. And then Peter Goatsby um, and I have been collaborating on Visual Snow. So with that, um, I think I've got a couple more minutes. Um, I've got five minutes for questions. Yes, Randy. <laughs> so <clears throat> hard to keep me from asking questions. But anyway, uh, so these are very, very common, as you know. And so uh, if, if we have patients with dry who also have migraine symptoms, which I agree, there, there's a fair amount of correlation. I mean, do you, do you want to see these in the clinic if they're not? I mean, I'm just telling you, if, if, I mean, if you guys, you're already hard to get into a headache clinic, and these people, and these people uh, come through very, very commonly. But um, I, I would just say an ophthalmologist, if they aren't comfortable, you know, starting something for somebody with migraine, send them to a neurologist. They've at least been trained in headache, and their primary care should be able to do it, too. But you could partner and say, you know, I'm worried that this dry eye problem is worsening their migraines. I'll work on the dry eyes. How about if you guys really work on the migraine symptoms and get, because I think if you get the migraine under control, the dry eye symptoms might be a little bit better too. Especially in my uh, practice, I, I see if I can do both and kind of get them kind of working together, then they may do a little bit better. And especially these chronic migraines. These are people that have migraine more than 15 well, days. Well, often as you control the migraine, uh, really a lot of their symptoms with their dry eye go away, even though, as Mark said, the actual clinical signs are getting worse. Yeah. So that, that keep, makes it very interesting. Yeah, it is. Yes. Right. So would you say something about hormonal regulation? I have a patient who had chronic migraine. She got pregnant, no migraines, two months after, two weeks after delivery, your migraines come back. That's unfortunately the true story. Uh, so it, uh, Bryce says a patient with migraines with pregnancy got completely went away and then uh, and then uh, two weeks after being pregnant they got their migraines back. That, that story is textbook. Um, 
Hormones do play a role in migraine, there's no question about it. It's usually the falling estrogen that seems to be the, the trigger for migraine, it's falling estrogen, and so after pregnancy, which is a very high estrogen state, the falling estrogen, they can go right back into migraine. And it, interestingly, uh, during pregnancy, people are almost immune to migraine. I've got some patients who've got like seven or eight kids because they felt, <laughs> they felt so good when they migraine. were pregnant that they decided that's what they were gonna do. So, so um, I guess you don't if you want a lot of kids, marry somebody with migraine. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you would treat with hormones. Uh, people have done that, uh, and there's, there's some literature to suggest hormonal manipulation, uh, but in my experience, the problem is, you know, there's a week before a period, there's a week of the period, a week after, that's three out of four weeks with ovulation going on in between there. It's so complicated that to, to mess with hormones, you, you end up in a, a mess. It, there are a few people who really do respond to hormonal therapy and steadying state things out. And these are people who would truly have like menstrual migraine, uh, but that's not very common, I have to say. Most people have more than just the headache at, around the time of menses. And it's a pretty massive dose as well to try to duplicate pregnancy. Uh, no, you don't try to do pregnancy. You just try to get to a steady state. You don't try to get that high. That, that would cause more trouble. So you know, uh, we, we uh, low dose, especially in migraine. Um, uh, oral contraceptives that are high dose are contraindicated, especially in migraine with aura. And uh, there's even controversy about anybody with migraine taking oral contraceptives. So, so that that we don't like to do. But uh, low dose, steady state sometimes has uh, been studied and does work for some people, not everybody. All right. Um, and I even finished on time, so Thank very you. good.